Amen. All right, so this is the first week where there's not a series, technically. I don't want to refer to it as a series. I called it a series when I was talking to Brother Russell beforehand. This will tech probably, most likely, just be a part one and a part two. But I'm going to be preaching about the promise of God. And this week, specifically, I'm going to be talking about our inheritance through Christ. Now, this will tie in and build upon some of the things that we learned, some of the things that we talked about in the Nature of God sermon. Or in the Nature of God series, that is. Here in Romans chapter number 8, I want to begin reading in verse number 15. The Bible says this. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. And then he says this. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Excuse me. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. Now watch this. That we are the children of God. Verse 17. And if children... Then heirs, heirs of God, so he repeats himself, then heirs, he wants to make it clear, for the children of God, then we're heirs, then we are heirs of God, and he says, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. As I said, the title of the sermon is Our Inheritance Through Christ, Our Inheritance Through Christ. Now I want to focus on, specifically on, if you begin reading there in verse number 16, notice how it ends. It says, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the first point is there that we are labeled and we are spoken as of being God's child. A lot of people will make this statement. You'll say, you know, (coughs) know, we're God's children. Oftentimes you're knocking doors, you're talking to random people. They'll just tell you we're all God's children. And that's not so. That shows an ignorance of the, of the doctrine, because this isn't a doctrine, something that's taught from beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. That shows an ignorance of the doctrine of being a child of God, why we are a child of God. Now, also on top of that, you will speak to Christians that will understand, hey, I'm a Christian, and because I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God. And even still, even a lot of Christians, they don't understand what it actually means to be a child of God or to be a son of God. Now, you'll notice right here specifically in this passage, he speaks of almost interchangeably, almost synonymously of being a child of God, being a son of God, and then he says being joint heirs with Christ, correct? The reason why, we went into this a little bit. We're going to look at some other passages and kind of delve into it deeper than we did in, in the other sermons. The reason why we are a child of God is because we are in Christ. The reason why we are an heir is, is you're, you are not an heir naturally or inherently in and of yourself through God. You are only an heir because you are in Christ. If you're not, if you're not in Christ, you're not an heir. If you're not in Christ, you're not a son of God. If you're not in Christ, you're not a child of God. Right. The only reason why you're a child of God is because Jesus was a child of God. The only reason why you're in, that you are, you know, uh, you know, that you would be a child of God, you would be a son of God, is because Jesus was a son of God. The only reason why you would be an heir of God is because Jesus was and is an heir of God. It's because you are in Christ. Now, notice this. Notice it says adoption here, right? In verse number. Uh, verse number 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. He's saying, so you didn't receive a spirit that should, that, that's of bondage like of the law. He just got done speaking of the law. And he says that that brings fear. He says, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Ye have received the spirit of adoption. And he says, whereby, so by that spirit we cry, Abba, which means, it's Aramaic, it means father. Right? So that spirit is the spirit of adoption. We are not, you know, begotten of God in the sense that we are God's only begotten son. We are in Christ. Now, I'm a son of God, but I was not, you know, born physically of God. As in the same way that Jesus Christ was born of God. Where he was actually conceived of the Holy Ghost. I am a son of God because I am adopted in his family through Christ. Now, we're going to look at this further. Go to Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3, go to verse number (coughs) 24. (coughs) Notice again the context is the law. Galatians uh, 3 and 4, they have a lot of similarities with, you'll notice in a lot of Paul's epistles, epistles, I didn't say a bad word, all right? (laughs) Paul's epistles, they'll have uh, have parallels. Like, you know, certain books will will strongly parallel, especially chapters. 
Now, Romans chapter number 8 parallels with Galatians chapter number 3 and 4 very much. So you notice him talking about the law and then talking about being children of God, talking about being an heir, and he'll also talk about bondage and things like that, just like Romans chapter number 8 does. Look at Galatians chapter number 4 and then uh, begin reading in verse number 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. And then he says, for, meaning because, for ye are all children of God. Now, this is the key that most people miss, by faith in Christ Jesus. So people out there in the world that say, we're all children of God, but then they have no faith in Christ Jesus. If you do not have your faith in Jesus Christ, if you're not only trusting in Jesus for your salvation, you are not a child of God. Sadly, right. you are not a child of God. The only people that are a child of God, by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, his righteousness is imputed unto you. His spirit, the same spirit, the spirit of Christ, like it talks about, is given unto you, the spirit of God. Your sins are then paid for, and you are in Christ. He accounts it as the record as you are a son of God. And when he looks at you, he looks at you through the, you know, the mirror, if you will, of being his son. Now, right here it says, for ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says, verse 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, and watch how he words this, have put on Christ. Notice that. Have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. He says, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, watch this also. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. Now watch this word heir come up again, because that's the topic tonight. Our inheritance through Christ <clears throat> and heirs according to the promise. So that passage there, he says, if you are Christ, if you are in Christ, if you've put on Christ, you have the spirit of Christ, right? Then you are Abraham's seed. Why? Because Christ was Abraham's seed, right? We're going to look at this passage in just a moment, but look over quickly because we get a little bit of that context. Galatians chapter number 3, verse number 6. He says in Galatians chapter number 3, verse number 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same, that those people, the ones that are of faith, are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Skip down to verse number 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive, watch this, the promise of the Spirit through faith. Verse 15, brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So notice that. Two people this, were given this promise, right? Abraham, why? Because he believed in the promise that was given him that was of Christ. It, it's very funny when you think about that and you try to understand that concept. God came to him and told him, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have, have Sarah conceive in her womb. And she's, you know, 90 years of age, ends up having a child when she's right around 100 years old. And God, Abraham believed Right? Believed in that promise, believed in that, you know, uh, in that covenant that God made with him, and he put his faith in that. And then God, when he looks back, he says that that the promise was given to Abraham and to his seed, right? But when you really, really stop and think about it very hard, that promise is technically because Abraham's getting in through what? Is it through works? No. Faith, of course, right? Faith in what? Faith in the seed, right? So because he believed that, the, that he believed in the seed, the promise is given to Abraham and his seed. But Abraham is in that seed is why he receives the promise in the first place. Nobody gets there without being in Christ is my point. Even Abraham himself, he didn't receive. I, this is going to become very relevant in just a moment. I'll word it like this. Abraham did not have this like special dispensation or something like that. He didn't have some special, you know, um, some special promise that was just given to him that why he was able to get in 
and then the seed. Abraham himself was also believing and had faith in the seed to come. That's why he inherited. He also inherited through the seed because he was in Christ. He trusted God that that, that, that seed would someday come. Now, when he makes the statement there, verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says, He saith not, and to seeds, plural he's saying, and to, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And he says, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So when he made that promise then originally, he told him to Abraham and to his seed, singular, right? So this was not a promise that was given to uh, you know, like the Zionists try to say to all of the Jews, all of Israel, they forever just get to, it's just this like carte blanche, there's, there's, there's no exceptions, God gave them a promise, you know, God is not a man that should lie, neither son of man that should repent, and they just get to keep that land forever no matter what. That's not how this works. That's not what this is about. There's a promise given, and you have to be, you have to be trusting in that seed in order to take part in that promise. And it was not given to seeds, plural, it was given to that one person. And if you trust in that one seed that was to come, which he tells you, which is Christ, then you can also take part in that blessing it calls in here. You can also take part in that promise. Or it works it like this. You can also take part in that inheritance. What's the first thing you think of when you hear the word inheritance? Hey, you're going to inherit something. What do most people talk about? Land? You think money? See where your mind is. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, immediately, the first thing I think of is like property or land, right? And when we go back to Genesis, I'm going to have you turn there. Go back to Genesis chapter number 15. That's where, the, that's where the emphasis lies, isn't it? It's on that land or on that property. It's on an inheritance. It is an inheritance in the exact same way that we think of an inheritance today, isn't it? He promised that, hey, Abraham, you and your seed, you're going to possess this land. This is going to be an inheritance that's given down to you. Do you understand that? That seed would inherit it. So the promise, I want you to catch that because this is, I think, a concept that people will miss sometimes. That inheritance, was it, was it something that Abraham had? Was, did Abraham have this land at the time that he came to him? He did not, did he? No. But he said the promise was given to, to Abraham and to his seed. And I am going to go ahead and say this preemptively, just because a lot of people are probably familiar with the story. Did Abraham ever get, while he was alive, did he ever get to own that land? He did not, ever. So was this something that, that Abraham himself had? Think about this concept. It's going to come in here. It, it come, it's going to become very relevant here in just a, a little while. It wasn't, was it? It was nothing that he ever actually grasped while on this earth, was it? Do you understand what I'm saying? So that inheritance has to be coming from some other angle, right? We know that it talks about the seed there. I'm going to read you also about the inheritance. Titus chapter number 3, verse number 7. <laughs> See that this is mentioned all over. Titus chapter number 3, verse number 7. That being justified by his grace. Justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according, watch this, to the hope of eternal life. The hope of eternal life. So notice, heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we see eternal life also being tied in with being an heir there. Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits, speaking of angels? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them? And it says, who shall be heirs of salvation. So there it talks about being an heir of salvation. Genesis chapter number 15. Genesis chapter number 15, verse number 1 says this, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. <clears throat> and Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given, thou hast given no seed. And lo, one board of, excuse me, and my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Say he's going to have many children, right? So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it, 
to him for righteousness. Now we can see the salvation of Abraham here taking place when he's given that promise that there will be a seed, right? There will be a seed that will come out, come out of thee. And he's saying that ultimately you will have you know, just as many children as the, as the stars. You're not even going to be able to count them. He tells him to go out there. And he says, he says he brought him forth abroad and said, look now, <coughs> excuse me, toward heaven. He says, and tell the stars. Tell means to count. He's telling him to count the stars. He says, if thou be able to number them. The point is you can't number them. If thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, so shall thy seed be. So we can see with that inheritance. You see the word heir coming up repeatedly, right? That, hey, Eleazar of Damascus, that guy is not going to be your heir. He is not going to what? What's an heir? He's not going to inherit the things that I'm going to give to you, right? But then he tells him, he says, you're going to have a child. And that will be your heir. That is who we will give the, you know, you will give your inheritance unto. Turn over to Genesis chapter number 28. Genesis chapter number 28. We can see this repeated again. The situation with Isaac here and Jacob. Genesis chapter number 28. Look at verse number 1, the beginning of the chapter again. It says, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram. Of the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife <coughs> from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. Watch this. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee. Now what is the blessing? We saw the blessing in Galatians 3 being used interchangeable with a covenant right, and then it also spoke of as an, as an inheritance. You'll see the same here. And to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit, watch this, the land. So what does it keep bringing up repeatedly about an inheritance? It, you know, it's about the land, right? The land wherein thou art a stranger. So right now, does it look like that Jacob, even so he saw Abraham, Abraham's gone. You know, Isaac, he's here. Is Isaac owning the land right now? Is Jacob owning the land? He's saying no. You're, we're gonna, but did they still believe the promise? Even though God told Abraham, hey, you're going to inherit this land. You know, you're going to inherit this land. But then Abraham died. That didn't take place. Isaac and Jacob still believe. Hey, I believe the promise of God that we will inherit that land, right? The land wherein you're a stranger. You will inherit the land. So notice the, that's one thing that I want, I, I want to point out. I want that to stay fresh in your minds during the sermon. Because we're going to come back to that. Specifically, the inheritance keeps speaking about the land. The land, right? The land. Talk about property. I want you to turn over to, uh, go over to, uh, turn to Daniel chapter number 7, verse number 13. Daniel chapter number 7, verse number 13. <coughs> so this promise, you know, of the inheritance that's passed down, you know, it's passed down from son to son. And that's exactly like we, we read in, <coughs> in Galatians chapter number 3, 16. That it's actually given specifically to one seed that is eventually going to come of that line. And the way that, that, that each person were to take a part in that promise is to believe the promise, right? We saw that have that take place with Abraham. Then the, the, the blessing is passed down repeatedly. You know, you, and you can follow that line on to David, right? And then we know that David received that. You know, Judah and then ultimately Jesse, Boaz, all of them, and then David. Uh, you know, Boaz, Jesse, David. Then it continually is passed down. Solomon, Rehoboam, it keeps going. And then we have Joseph and then Mary, right? So that, that's all the way to that line. And then Jesus Christ was born, of which actually was the inheritor. The person that would inherit this promise. He's the one that the promise would actually be given to. Now I'm going to read to you in Luke chapter number 1, verse number 32, something else that we're going to look at about this promise. Because we inherit with Christ in many ways. One of the major things that's brought up is, is inheriting the land. It often speak about the land. Specifically, what land was it? At that time, it was referred to as the land, the land of Canaan, right? And they would talk about the land of Canaan, and then later became, you know, physically the land of Israel, right? Everybody's familiar with that? We also, though, the Bible will talk about, about the inheritor, the promise over time. It will speak of him as a king. Once it was David... Then, and he possessed that throne, David as a man, the seed that would come forth of David, the Bible will often speak of him as being a king, 
of him as ruling and him reigning, right? If we are in Christ and we inherit all the things that Christ will inherit, the Bible speaks of him as a king. The Bible speaks of him as a priest. And it also speaks of us in the same fashion. I'm going to read to you a promise that, that, that is spoken of, a prophecy that is fulfilled. I believe we read this last week, but it's also in Luke chapter number 1, verse number 32. It says, He shall be great, speaking of the, the inheritor, the Messiah, Jesus, of course, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Notice he's inheriting that throne. And he shall reign, so he's a king, over the house of Jacob. Now watch this. Forever. And it says, And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now you're there in Daniel chapter number 7. I'll point out something very interesting to you in Daniel chapter number 7. Look at verse number 13. It's also another verse that we read in tandem with that just last week. He said, I saw in the night vision to behold one like the Son of Man. Now this is the Messiah. This is the promised child. That seed that was spoken of from Abraham that would come. He says, I, behead, I saw in the night visions. And behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. That all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. It says in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. I want you to look over now at verse number, look at verse number 18. Very interesting statement. We'll read verse 17 first. It says, these great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Verse 18, it says, But the saints of the Most High, watch this, shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. And it says, even forever and ever. So notice how it speaks of, first of the Son of Man, right? He's going to come, and it says, and he's going to rule, right? It speaks of him ruling and reigning. Out, It's the Son of Man. Now he's going to rule and reign. He's going to have a kingdom, it says, and he's going to rule and reign forever. And then it talks about the saints of the Most High, how they're going to come. And what does it mean to possess something? To own it, right? Like as if inheriting something. And it says the saints of the Most High, the same exact wording about the Messiah, it says that they will come and they will possess, look at this, the kingdom forever and ever. I want you to turn over and read a couple passages in the book of Revelation. Go over to Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 6. Here, Revelation chapter number 5, verse number 9 says this, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to loose the se- and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every king- kindred and tongue and people and nation. And then he says this, So he's speaking to Jesus, and, and, hath, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests. So notice... That he redeemed us, and in doing so, he made us a king, and he made us a priest. Which is why the Son of Man, he's a priest. We inherit through Christ our inheritance in him, in his seed. All the things that he will inherit, the kingdom, the land. The Bible speaks of us also inheriting all these things. The Bible also speaks of us being a priest. Why? Because he's a priest. Why are we a son of God? Because Jesus is a son of God. So we can see that there in Romans, uh, in Revelation chapter number 5, verse number 9. I want to compare something here. Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 6, the Bible almost says the same thing. We'll read verse number 5 here as well. I want to explain something that a lot of people are very confused about. Verse number 5 says, And from Jesus Christ was the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So who is that speaking of? Jesus, right? Him is Jesus. He, he loved us and washed us, right, from our sins in his own blood and hath, Jesus, right? Make sure you're paying attention to hath made us kings and priests. Why are we made a king and priest? Because he is a king and priest. Now look, pay attention. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. First, I want to point out the point of the sermon, and then I'm going to explain... You know, this, this weird interpretation that a bunch of idiots have about this passage. Number one is, he made us kings and priests because he's a king and he's a priest. That's why we are also kings and priests, because we are in Christ. The Bible speaks of that repeatedly. We saw the Son of Man taking the kingdom. He rules, right, forever and ever. Then who do we see taking the kingdom? Because we rule with, with Christ. The Bible speaks of that. 
Uh, there's another passage, I forgot to turn to it, but the Bible talks about in Revelation chapter number 20 that we will rule and reign with Christ. It talks about the millennial reign, we're going to reign with Christ. There's multiple passages where it talks about that. But people will go to this passage and they'll say, see, God has a father. Because there's this weird teaching, as I preached on just a couple of weeks ago, about, you know, that God, that Jesus, <coughs> he wasn't begotten, like, in the sense of the word begotten in every dictionary, in the sense of what you understand as being a diction, uh, being begotten, of just the regular definition of being a son, that you have to have a birth. That's not how he's begotten. Let me tell you how he's begotten. He was begotten in eternity past. And he's always been a son. And you want me to prove it to you? And they'll go to something like this. This is one of their verses that I've heard people bring up. And, and y'all, it's one of their verses. I've never heard anybody else try to use this verse because it is, it is the worst interpretation of it. It really is an elementary. I'm not exaggerating. If you've read your Bible to, through some of the stuff, hey, it's difficult. This is not difficult. It's, it's, it's simple grammar. And if you stop and think about what it's actually saying, you'll understand what it means. It's a retard. It's a really stupid I throw that word around sometimes, and maybe it loses its meaning, but let me make, make this clear. This really is a very stupid interpretation. So he says there in verse 6, and hath made us, so Jesus made us, kings and priests, it says, unto God and his Father. And they'll say, see, he made us kings and priests unto God and unto God's Father. No, that's not what it's saying. And I'll explain to you why that cannot be what it's saying. Because who's making us a king and priest? Jesus. Jesus, okay? He's the one making us the king and priest, okay? Who has a father? Jesus. Jesus, right? So this is now what you have if you try to take that interpretation, which is retarded. You have Jesus making us kings and priests unto God himself, speaking of him, unto God and his father. Makes zero sense to try to interpret it that way. Right. Makes zero sense. If, if you're going to take that, try, that interpretation, well, maybe you could say this because you believe in the three people of the Trinity. He made us kings and priests unto God. Maybe that's the Holy Spirit and his Father. You, unless you, and, I don't know if people believe now that the Holy Spirit was begotten in eternity past. Because that's the only other interpretation you could use. No, this is what it's saying. Jesus made us kings and priests unto God. And then it's going to restate who God is. His Father. Right. It's really that simple. And that, something like that, if you just stop and break it down and just pay attention to it and just read the passage a couple times, who's making you the king and priest? Jesus. And why are you a king and priest? Because Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, the high priestly prayer in John 17. Who's the mediator? Who's the intercessor? Right. Jesus. Yeah. Right? He's the one that stands in between. And he makes a king, us a king and priest unto God and unto his, Jesus, his father. Right. I mean, come on. It's a stupid, it's a retarded interpretation, and it really does show that if if you're going to stand up and preach something like this or repeat something like this, you obviously are looking for some, maybe you believe this, maybe you're blinded by this truth, but you didn't really look at the passage very deeply, because that's definitely not what it's teaching. It's speaking of Jesus as the mediator, because he's a priest, that's what a priest is, he makes intercession, mediates, as the mediator between man and man. And God, Jesus hath made us, made us kings and priests because he's a king and a priest unto God. He's in, in the middle and unto his father, Jesus, his father. Right. It's repeating the same thing. God is Jesus, his father. We're a king and priest unto God and we're a king and priest unto Jesus, his father, who is God. Right. The Bible, if you know the Bible well, you'll know that maybe somebody who's not familiar with the Bible, they wouldn't understand that the Bible repeats itself all the time. That is the style of the Bible. When you know the Bible, you know, you would understand that interpretation is very consistent with the rest of the Bible. That truly is a very elementary, sophomoric interpretation of the Bible. It just shows an ignorance of something. It shows that at least, at the very least, it shows dishonesty and a lack of diligence in the scriptures of not actually looking at something and thinking this through. Because once you think it through, it's like, well, Jesus made us kings and priests unto God. Now, I don't know who that person is, but in that you know interpretation, it's not Jesus. Then unto his father. It's like, what in the world? It just doesn't even make sense when you try to play it out in your mind. It's because it's, it's not what the Bible's teaching. This is the type of stupid stuff that you get into when you have other false doctrines. That's why it matters a lot. About why I preach the sermon on the Godhead, on the nature of God. <laughs> Especially such a key, important doctrine. 
When people get into error and people start preaching something, especially when they embrace something they know is wrong, they're just very, in, you know, they're, they're disingenuous and they're just preaching this just because, you know, you know, for whatever reason. I'm just saying, speaking in generality right now. Let's not get personal, all right? So let's say whatever reason somebody embraces heresy, they will get into more heresy because the Bible is so tightly knit. The Bible is like, you know, you know, it's like it's like fine gears that turn together and you will start interpreting verses falsely with this with this type of doctrine or concept in your mind. And then and then also, by, by the way, God will start to blind your eyes and he will cause you to get into other false doctrine like Jesus did to the disciples a couple of times. And there's there's all different types of things that can happen. You know, when you when you embrace false doctrine purposely or you can just stand up. And preach and preach stupidity like this from this passage right here. Then you know that God has a father. That's two gods. Number one, right. God and His Father. That's two gods, which obviously they, you know, no one cares about that because they say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. But you know what? There's only one God, buddy. We only believe in one God. It's retarded. Right. Makes zero sense. It's dumb. That's what this passage is actually teaching. But the reason why we're a king and priest. <laughs> back onto the subject of the sermon. Is because Christ is a king and priest. And we're inheriting through him. We are in Christ. Therefore, we, <coughs> we, we, we acquire the things that Christ acquired. We have put on Christ, right? We're going to look through the book of Revelation because this concept is seen in the book of Revelation here. Go to Revelation, <coughs> excuse me, Revelation chapter number two. Revelation chapter number two. The Bible will talk about overcoming. We saw in Galatians chapter number three that those that over that we overcome were children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, right? Well, in 1 John chapter number five, verse number one, the Bible says this: Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So, what does that mean? If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, if you're born of God, that means that you're a child of God, right? You're born of Him from Him, saying that you, it's talking about being adopted as a son of God, a child of God. And everyone that loveth Him that begat loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. You skip down to verse number four, it repeats the same thing. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. So this time it <laughs> talks about overcoming, right? And how do how are we born of God according to verse number one? By believing that Jesus is the Christ. It says you're born of God, right? So, so to overcome, you have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. And whatever overcomes it, it repeats it here. It says, and who, and who is he that overcometh the world? But, but, but he that believeth. That Jesus is the Son of God. So it repeats it there. So we can see there a definition of what it means to overcome and how you overcome. It is those that believe that Jesus is the Christ. And then it just repeats the same thing because Christ just means Son of God. Those that believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now look here in Revelation chapter number 2, verse number 7. We're going to see some of the promises of those that, that, that are things that we will inherit. Yeah, so it's Revelation chapter number 2. Verse number 7. The Bible says this. He that, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh. Now that we know what it means to overcome. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now I want you to look over. That was verse number 7. Go to verse number 11 in the same passage. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So notice promise number one, promise number two are very similar. One of them is saying that you're going to inherit, you're going to overcome, and you're going to be in heaven, basically. You talk about being in the paradise of God. You'll be where the tree of life is, right? It's a reference back to Genesis chapter number one. And it's a very similar situation. The Bible's very interesting how it does kind of a circle. You know, it ends almost where it begins. And then if you do your Bible reading, you end Revelation 22, you begin back in Genesis 1. It's very interesting when you when you look at it that way. And when I finish my Bible reading, that's how I do it. It's very interesting. So we see here though that they that they're with those that overcome, they are gonna they are going to overcome, they're going to be given. He said, Will I give, right? In a few minutes we'll see him use the word grant. So he says, Give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, saying they're going to go to heaven. Here it he kind of repeats the same thing, like I said, he's saying they're not going to be hurt. Of the second death. What is he saying there? Basically, you're not going to go to hell, right? Okay, well, look at, uh, so, <clears throat> you see there verse number 7. We read verse number 11. The next one is in verse number 17, same chapter. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto, unto the churches. 
To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Saving he that receiveth it. Look at verse number uh, 26. Verse number 26. Same chapter. So all these are all the things that are given to him that overcomes. Verse number 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. And he says this, even as I received of my father. Even as I received of my father. It's a very interesting statement. We're gonna, I'm going to focus on that here in just a minute. Look at uh, Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 5 now. Next chapter. These are different promises that are given to the seven churches when John wrote this letter. The, re the letter, which is now known, we know it as, of course, the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 7, he says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key, the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Did I skip that? I said verse number 5, sorry, and not verse number 7, sorry. Go look at verse number 5. Verse number 5 is what I wanted. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And he says, And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father, and he says, and before his angels. Now I want you to look at another chapter, or another verse in this chapter, verse number 12. So he's writing to all these churches. These are all different promises that he's given to them, to those that overcome. Verse number 12, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. He says, and I will write upon him my new name. When you look at these closely, the majority of these are basically just saying, if you overcome, you're going to go to heaven. That's what the majority of these are. He's saying you're going to be in the temple of God. He's going to make a pillar in the temple of God. What's a pillar? It's something that's not, not to be moved, right? He talks right before that, if we look in verse number 5, he's going to, he's going to, be, he's going to clothe them in white raiment. Who's clothed in white raiment? Those that are in heaven. Saints, right? He says at the beginning that, that you know, we're going to give you uh, the, the, the grant you to be able to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Saying you're going to go to heaven. Then the next one was where he talked about they're not going to be hurt at the second death. Saying what? You're going to go to heaven, right? You're going to overcome. That's what the majority of these relate to. Then we saw him talking about how we're going to be a king. Why? Because Jesus Christ made us kings and priests. These are all different things that we are inheriting through Christ. Look at uh, Revelation chapter number 3 and then look at verse number 17. <coughs> yeah, that's Revelation chapter number 3. Yeah, verse number 17. That is, yeah, that's not right. Look at verse number 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Now, I touched on this last week. And I talked about, I explained this, how he is the mediator. And how we inherit things through Christ. Because Christ is a king, we are a king. As I just spoke about. Because Christ is a priest, we are a priest. Because Christ, and who has a throne? Someone that reigns. When he talks about, uh, you know, uh, just a moment ago, he says that they, they be broken to shivers. You know, uh, and, he, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken. These are all promises that are given to the, the Messiah who is spoken of as the Son, specifically in Psalm 2. He's actually spoken of, that's one of the very few times that the Messiah is identified as being God's Son, as being the Son of God. And in this passage, he says, I will give, them, I will give him power over the nation, saying you are going to be a king. Right? Here, Christ says that he's going to grant. He says, I will grant him to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down, with my Father in his throne. Well, I want you to go to two places here. I want you to turn first to Revelation chapter number 21. And we did look at this just the other day. But I want you to go to Ephesians chapter number 1 also. And just keep your, that, your hand there. We'll go there in just a moment to Revelation chapter number 1. But I want to go to Ephesians chapter 1 where this is spoken of again. Specifically of us inheriting through Christ. And Ephesians chapter number one, I'm going to read portions of this here because this is a that's a, one of the major topics of Ephesians chapter number one is inheriting. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 1, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So notice that they are in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, two things I want to point out is, number one, if you would have noticed in verse number three, the very beginning there, he said, blessed be the God and Father. So notice it's repeating itself. Just like I said, Revelation chapter number one, verse number six, God and Father. He's Jesus' is God. He's Jesus' is Father, right? And then what does he say? Made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Same person. God and Father. It's not God's Father. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. Right. It's a man, Christ Jesus' Father. That's why he can say that. But notice also it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us. Now, remember it in Genesis chapter number 15, when he came to Abraham and he talked about the inheritance. He talked about the promise. We also saw in Galatians chapter number 3, he kept referring to it as what? As a blessing. That blessing comes through who? The seed, singular, right? The Christ. All the things that the Christ would inherit one day, all the promises that you can find in your Bible that the Christ will get one day ruling and reigning on the earth, guess what? You get those promises through Christ. There aren't special overcomes. There aren't special things that take place. Anyone, you know who he is that overcomes? You believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You believe that Jesus is the Christ. That puts you in Christ. All the things that he is promised, all the things that he will inherit, you receive those things too. In uh, Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 21, it said, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. And I talk about how people will interpret that. Well, there's two people sitting next to each other. Therefore, he that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Do you know how many people have overcome? Millions, bil yay, billions of people. That's a big throne, buddy. You got billions of people sitting in the throne with you? That's a horrible interpretation of that passage as well. Right. The Bible is talking about inheriting through Christ. All the promises that are given in Revelation when he writes to the churches, you're going to overcome. Why? Because you're in Christ. The things that he inherits are the things that you will inherit. You also have, you also be a king, and you will also have a throne, and you will have the opportunity to rule and reign with Christ. Notice here how this verse actually says that we are present day seated in Christ Jesus. Why? Look at verse number three again. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Keep reading. According as he hath chosen us in him before the, the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. Before him in love, what? Having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. <coughs> and whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, very interesting, might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, says even in him. People talk about you know dispensations. They'll say, well, they, the people in the Old Testament, they weren't in Christ. They weren't believing in Christ. Notice what he's saying right there. The dispensation of the fullness of times is talking about the rapture. And at that time, he's, the, he's going to gather together he says he's going to gather together, together in, in one, all things in Christ. Now, you know what the things that are in Christ? Both which are in heaven, those that are saved in the Old Testament, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Being all gathered together because they all go to heaven. Those of the Old Testament, they were also in Christ. Even in him. Verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. In who? In Christ is where we receive that inheritance. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Verse number 14 talks about being being inheriting through him again, in whom, in whom ye also trusted. I'm sorry, verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance. We're talking about the Holy Spirit of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And it being, where's that verse at? Being seated in, in Christ Jesus. Oh, verse uh, 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word? Saying he's going to reveal that at one point. The inheritance of the saints is talking about. 
who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own, at his own right hand in the heavenly places. I must have read over it sometimes but I, at one point, but I don't, I don't remember exactly where it's at. But it talks about us being seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Does anybody know where that verse is in there? It might be in another chapter. I'm not exactly verse sure where it's at. It's chapter 2? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, verse number 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So do you know what that means when it says that we are that we are that he hath made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? It's talking about whatever the Christ was going to inherit, those are the things that you are going to inherit. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when he raised up Christ from the dead and gave him a throne, I'm in Christ, so guess what I get? A throne. You understand what I'm saying? So when in Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 17, it makes the statement, He that overcometh, that believes in me, you know, because we become a son of God, we are able, then able to inherit through Christ. He that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down in my, with my father in his throne. It's talking about you being in Christ, overcoming through Christ, and you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because what's the whole passage here, Ephesians 1? What verse keeps coming up to? Inheritance, inheritance, inheritance. Right? We are joint heirs with Christ. We ourselves are not a direct heir, are we? But we are a joint heir in the sense that we have been adopted in Christ. And because Christ is an heir, we also someday will inherit the things that are promised to the Christ, that are promised to the Son of God. Now I want you to turn to, uh, <coughs> well, go back to Revelation chapter number 21. We're going to compare scripture to scripture. We're going to go back to the very initial promise that was given to uh, to Abraham. Now, like I mentioned earlier, <coughs> go to go to Hebrews and we'll see this first. So keep your hand here. Hopefully, you have a bulletin because you need to get three places. Keep your hand here in Revelation chapter number 21. And then I want you to get Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11 and one of your other hands. I don't know how many you got. One of your other hands. <laughs> Hebrews chapter number 11. And then get uh, Genesis chapter number 17. Genesis chapter number 17. Now, the first thing I want to point out is going to be from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 11. <coughs> Hebrews chapter number 11. I alluded to this earlier. Just from you know your Bible knowledge, you should know this, or you did know this, actually, when I asked the question. But if you look in Hebrews chapter number 11, I want you to look at verse number 18. It points out something real interesting here. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should... Watch this, after received for an inheritance. So he was afterwards going to receive an inheritance, right? He obeyed, and he went out, it says, not knowing whether he waits. So, you know, Abraham left his home, right? We're very familiar with that. He left his home with his, with it. you know, his father came with him, and then his father later died when they were traveling, and he left. He obeyed, and he had no idea where he was going. You know, he went out on faith. Verse 9 says this, by faith he sojourned. Now, the word sojourn is a word that's important to understand that word in this context because it's a word that means you are temporarily staying somewhere. He sojourned in the land of promise. So he was in the land of promise, but notice he sojourned there. Watch this. As in a strange country. Now, let's stop for just a minute. What does the word strange mean in the Bible? It means foreign. So is, is this his land right now? It's not his land. Abraham never inherited this land. It's very important. Abraham never inherited this land while he was on, on the earth. In a strange land, in a strange country, I'm sorry, in a strange country, it says, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. Watch this. The heirs with him of the same promise. Verse number 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations. And then it says, whose builder and maker is God. So that's interesting. It tells you what Abraham was looking for. I mean, the guy had a lot of faith. You know, he was going, and he thought God was going to lead him. He had a misunderstanding of something. We're going to get into that. But he thought he was looking for a city, the Bible says. When he has faith in God, he looked for a city that God had built. 
that where God was the maker. And it, it gives you a very, very there's a specific word. And, and the King James Bible is perfect. And when you look up words, you can study, you know, by looking up every time a word shows up, you can study the context. And nothing in the Bible is incidental, accidental, or coincidental. Everything in the King James Bible is perfect. It is the word of God. You know, even seeds, how that S is on is not on the end of there. Seed is important. So he explains the end, you know, he didn't say seeds. He only said seed. So that S not being there is very, very important. I want you to look over in Revelation chapter number 21. Chapter number 21. <clears throat> the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 21, it says, <clears throat> verse number one, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And he says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, if you go back to Hebrews chapter number 11, it gives you a little bit more detail a little bit later in that passage. <coughs> it says in verse number 16, uh, we'll read verse number 15 as well. And truly, if they had been mindful... Of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Watch this. But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. And watch what it says. For he hath prepared for them a city. So the Bible talks about here that God prepared for them a city. And the city specifically that we see that God prepared for them in Revelation chapter number 21 is what city? The city of New Jerusalem. Now look over when it describes the city of New Jerusalem. Look down in verse number 10. Revelation chapter number 21, verse number 10. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious. Even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a, a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city, watch this, had twelve foundations in them. Had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now, when we see the Bible talks about in Hebrews chapter number eleven, there it specifically is speaking of Abraham, and it says that he sojourned in the land, right? He sojourned in the land that he never inherited, that he never inherited that promise that he was given, and he actually never owned or possessed that land. And it gives you a couple of hints about the actual city that he was looking for, or the city that God had promised for him. And it says that he saw the city that God hath prepared for him. For him. What does it say in, in Revelation chapter number 21, the very beginning there? What it says, it, it, that the city was, it, it, he, that it came down, it says it was as, it was as a, a bride, right? A city that God had prepared, he says, as a bride adorned for her husband. Not only that, it says that he saw a city that had foundations. You go over to Revelation chapter number 21, and that New Jerusalem, what's a specific aspect? Does it only have one foundation? No, it says it tells you that it has, it has foundations, plural. So the city that he was seeking for, and maybe he didn't realize this, maybe he didn't understand this, but in trusting in the Christ, the things that the Christ was going to inherit, the specific city that the Christ would inherit, that land that he was going to obtain was a land of foundations, a land that would have foundations, plural. Now I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 17. Genesis chapter number 17. <coughs> Genesis chapter number 17, like I mentioned to you, and then we'll look at Genesis chapter number 17. It's going to be verse number uh, verse number 7. Genesis chapter number 17, look at verse number 7. So this is after he comes to him and he's establishing the, the covenant. <coughs> Genesis chapter number 17, he says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee. And thy seed after thee, says, in their generations. And notice what he says, for an everlasting covenant. 
And he says, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So he's saying, speaking to Abraham right now. Put yourself in Abraham's perspective. From Abraham's point of view, he's saying that I'm going to give unto you and unto your seed. And he said, and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. And then watch what he says. All the land of Canaan. And then look what he says next. For an everlasting possession. So he says he's going to give it unto him and unto his seed. For an everlasting possession. And then he makes the statement. And I will be their God. Now when you read this entire passage. It's talking about him specifically establishing that covenant. And the covenant is given as you see to the seed. It's given unto, it's given unto Abraham and unto his seed. Now, when you go back to Revelation chapter number 21, go back to Revelation chapter number 21, and you look at verse number 1, you'll notice a very specific short little phrase that it says here in Revelation chapter number 21. Begin reading read again. I want to read this one more time in verse number 1. He says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. He says, For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And he said, And I, John, saw the holy Jer city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. And he says, Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then it says this, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. It says, And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. And now watch this statement. It says, And be their God. You go back to Genesis chapter number 17, and he tells you, it tells Abraham specifically, you are going to possess this land. Abraham dies, and he never received that land because the promise was not given specifically about that land that was on that earth at that time. You know, you see Abraham, you see Isaac, you see Jacob, all these generations passing on, but and did they end up inheriting that land in their lifetime? Descendants of theirs did, and people maybe at that time might have been confused looking at it, but that promise was never given specifically to them. Do you know what that promise was given to? It was given to Christ. And Abraham was in Christ. And that's why he tells them that it's going to it's an everlasting covenant. It's an everlasting covenant, and he said that you will it for an everlasting possession. Think, how is Abraham going to inherit that land in this lifetime as an everlasting possession? And you know how he ends that covenant or that promise when he's speaking unto him? He said, and I will be their God. And then you look here in verse number three. It says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with man and he will dwell with them. Watch that. And who's it talking about? It says and he will dwell with them. It says, and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Do you know what that's talking about? It's talking about the Christ. Do you know who inherited that? The Christ inherited that land. And when, when he came to him, I want you to think about this. The person that was giving him the promise, the person that was saying that I'm going to bless you and I'm going to give this land unto you and unto your seed. Do you know who that seed was? It was the one that was talking to Abraham. That seed came down later on and he was born on this earth as a man. And Abraham never inherited that land through a possession specifically given unto Abraham. You know why? Because he had inherited it through Christ. And the seed came. And then you see that Abraham was looking for a city that had foundations. What city was it? It was the city of New Jerusalem. Who inherited New Jerusalem? Christ inherited New Jerusalem. And you know what? It, it, you know, when we see here the new heaven and the new earth, and we see, we see you know, uh, it, it talks about New Jerusalem coming down from God. You know, it says, out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It says, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That is a direct reference to the body, the man Christ Jesus. And then he says, and he will dwell with them. And he says, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. This right here is the fulfillment of Genesis chapter number 17, where the promise is, is repeatedly given throughout all the generations, because the promise was given to one person. The promise was given to an heir. 
The promise was given to a son that was a son of God. Think about this. You know the reason why? There was nothing special from Abraham because Abraham didn't have anything. God would have been the one getting it. This is what I want, to, I want to end with. I want you to think about this concept. The things that Abraham was going, that Abraham inherited or was going to inherit was even through that seed. Do you, do you know why? It wasn't because people think all the time, all the Zionists and stuff, there's something special about Abraham. Abraham had nothing. The only thing that was special about Abraham was that of his, of his line would come the seed who was the son of God. And that seed inherited everything through God. That seed inherited all things through God because Abraham also was in Christ. Abraham received that promise as well. And Abraham was able to inherit as a son of God. The reason why we're children of God, the reasons why we're given anything, why we inherit anything, why we are heirs of God is because we are in Christ. And everything, you know why Christ is dwelling there? Because he came down. He didn't need, you know, he didn't need, you know, the Bible talks about him being the Lord of glory. He, he was in glory already. He didn't need anything. The only reason he came down was so that he could redeem us and bring us unto himself. And then when he did so, he also made us and gave us all the things that he received. Everything that he received and everything that... You know, the Christ was promised in the Old Testament. All of those things are given to us through him. The reason why we inherit anything is because we're in Christ. The promise that was given to Christ, that inheritance. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord God, for what Christ did for us, dear Lord. We thank you, dear Lord, for the inheritance, dear God, that is in Christ. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that you didn't just redeem us, but that you gave us all these great promises, dear Lord, that you gave us so many so many great and wonderful things, dear God, uh, being kings, being priests, of, of dwelling with you, dear Lord God, and that you became a man. And we love you so much. We ask you just to be with us. Also, bless the food and uh, and bless the Ray family. And then also, I, I, would, uh, I would ask you to look out for uh, Jessica Yates, dear Lord God, just be with her. And uh, help her to be able to get over her migraine. Just bless our church. We love you. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen.